شکر مولای محل تصمیم میگیره که یک زن بگیره وقتی که زنای محل خبر میشه که مولا زن میگیره چهار پنج تا از یا میره پیش مولا از یک زن توصیف میکنه که این زن بسیار خوب زن است همین رتما بگیر خب مولا قناعت میکنه عروسی میکنه یک شب خانه میه با یک دانه خربوزه خربوزه میه خانه یه زنش میبینه میگه که مولا میگه که چرا دو دانه خربوزه آردی این روز خب مولا سهل میکنه چیزی نمیگه سر سفره که میشینه باز زنش سهل میکنه میگه مولا میگه که خودت آمده کم بود که یک نامحرم دیگر دا پولیت آردی یکی است مولا میبینه که والای اندیوال هر چیز دو تا میبینه میگه که من دواله نرسته که اگر دو تا میبینی بی بی همین من را دو تا نبی حالا مگر که از خستگی اگر چشمای تان من را دو تا میبینن با زمانت میگم که طرف من جناب موین سایی و سیارمن و این طرف هم جناب آقای تیموریست ایزان سایی بی داستان مجبور است خود تان در انگلیسی بگوین بگوین نه 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 for translation, it's okay. Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, dear President, uh, Dr. Ali Rastbin, and honorable presenters and guests, uh, it's an honor to be here and to speak with you. Uh, I'll just speak a few words in English, but then I will continue in Persian. Uh, the reason that I uh, gave this title, uh, Enigmas of Peace and Networks of War, uh, for my today's presentation is that it's over 40 years that we are talking about peace, but really uh, we don't have a direct access to peace anymore. And this is a little bit uh, elusive and a little bit misleading to talk about peace in Afghanistan. So therefore, for me, peace is an enigma in the context of Afghanistan. So it's not that we can really directly have peace negotiations, whether with Taliban or non-Taliban. So no, we are dealing with an enigma, so it's not with the peace. Also, in the context of war, we talk about war and conflict in Afghanistan, but for me, it is not the war itself, but rather it's a network or networks of war that you are dealing with. So this is what is the, my main uh, concept, and I will speak it uh, in Persian, not to break uh, with the tradition and not to make uh, jobless uh, our dear <laughs> translator here. <laughs> خب به دلیلی که ما عنوان این سخنرانی را معماهای صلح و شبکه های جنگ نامیدیم خب به این خاطر است که ما اصلا دسترسی مستقیم به خود صلح نداریم ما که اگر از گفتمان صلح گپ میزنیم از مذاکرات صلح گپ میزنیم از دیالوگ های صلح گپ میزنیم در حقیقت ما بر روی موضوع صلح خود صلح گپ نمیزنیم صلح تبدیل شده به یک معما به یک چیستان ما داریم روی این معما گپ میزنیم حالا بخاطر که این معما را ما بتانیم باز بکنیم این معما صلح در بین پوشش جنگ قرار گرفته اگر ما بخوایم این معما را باز کنیم ما باید بریم بدانیم که با این جنگی که در افغانستان است این خشونت و نزایی که از این را باید درک کنیم به این خاطر از دیدگاه ما خود مسئله جنگ هم در افغانستان به آن سادگی نیست که ما میایم یا طالب میگیم یا غیر طالب میگیم یا القاعده داعش هر کسی که باشم یا نیروهای خارجی یا درونی بلکه ما با شبکه های از جنگ روبرو هستیم یعنی ما با خود جنگ روبرو نیستیم ما با شبکه های جنگ روبرو هستیم و در بیش از چهار دهه که گذشت در افغانستان جنگ و خشونت محصول یک سری از تعاملات پیچیده ای که در اون مداخلات خارجی هست در اون اختلافات داخلی خود مردم افغانستان است و در اون همچنان میراث جنگ سرد وجود دارد ما با این یک محصول این جنگی و وضعیت کنونی افغانستان محصول این تعاملات است جناب آقای شما میخواهید که ادامه بتون یا هر وقتی که خودتون خواستید شیرین شیرین مهربونتون شیرین چی میگه شما یا بیشتر برم یک 
Okay. Okay. We, we reached an agreement, a peace agreement, that I will do a, a brief English uh, summary of my own talk. Yeah? <laughs> so I think that's the best settlement to give him a bit of pause as well, a bit of break, so he deserves as well. Um, so the current situation in Afghanistan is the product of a series of complex uh, uh, international interventions, internal disagreements uh, and rivalries within the country, and as well as uh, a heritage, uh, which is not uh, necessarily a good word in this context, but is uh, uh, of uh, what we have uh, uh, from the era of uh, Cold War. Or rather, the word legacy might be a better word, the legacy of Cold War. When we look at the, at the context of the, of the Cold War itself, uh, Afghanistan has become a chessboard. Afghanistan over the past 40 years or 45 years have become a chessboard. And in, in this uh, chessboard, uh, Afghanistan is geopolitically located between uh, Central Asia and South Asia. Uh, everybody who studies uh, geopolitics of the region understands what I mean here. So, and one of the reasons why Afghanistan has to be uh, kept in a volatile situation is to make sure that uh, forces from the Central Asia, from the north, will not cross over the bridge called Afghanistan to the South Asia, because that will uh, jeopardize the political and the economic uh, interest of the United States and its allies. And of course, then, at the time of the Cold War era, you had uh, Pakistan that was rival to India, and Pakistan didn't want to be sandwiched between Afghanistan and uh, uh, India, and uh, uh, Afghanistan and in India. خب در دوران جنگ سرد افغانستان واقعا به تخته شطرنج تبدیل شد بود در این تخته شطرنج افغانستان به پل دیدن به افغانستان به عنوان یک پل نگاه می شد که بین آسیای مرکزی و آسیای جنوبی قرار داشت و این پل باید چنان مانند پل سراد باید چنان آتشی نبود که نباید هیچ نیروی از آسیای میانه به جنوب آسیا سفر بکنه یا وارد شود چون اگر که اتحاد شوروی وقت مثلا به جنوب آسیا می رسید خب علاقمندی های سیاسی و اقتصادی امریکا را به خطر می انداخت به این خاطر افغانستان باید همیشه در یک حالت تشنج نگاه می شد که همین سیاست یا همین دیدگاه هنوز هم ادامه دارم خب این جنگ سرد که نیاز زیاد برش صحبت رویش هم نیست شما می دانید که در 1979 بلاخره اتحاد شوروی داخل افغانستان می و افغانستان اشغال میکنه و حزب دموکراتی خلق افغانستان حمایت میکنه و در برابر از این گروه مجاهدین ایجاد میشه اگرچه که این گروه ها در دوران دولت سردار محمد داود خان ایجاد شده ولی بیشتر تقویت میشن و مجاهدین امریکا و پاکستان کشورهای عربی حمایت میکنه و در این جاسته که ما در بحث جیوپولیتیک افغانستان ما برای اولین بار شاهد رقابت های چند بعدی یا چند بچهی میشیم از یک طرف اتحاد شوروی داخل افغانستان شده که امریکا میخواه که اتحاد شوروی شکست بخوره و گلمش از, از دروازه یا از منطقه آسیای جنوبی برچیده شد و اگر که شکست بخوره که تا خود مسکو که نور الله نور خب در این حال شما میبینید که مجاهدین توسط پاکستان کمک میشن یک تعداد از این مجاهدین توسط ایران کمک میشن عربستان سعودی با عنوان یک به جمله رهبر دنیای اهل سنت و ایران به عنوان رهبر دنیای اهل تشیع اینها با هم رقابت خود دارند هندوستان با پاکستان رقابت خود دارند این رقابت های منطقوی باعث از این شکل در افغانستان هر کدامی از اینها گروه های مشخص را به خاطر منافع خودشان uh, Himalayat Bukuna. During this uh, Cold War era when the Soviet Union uh, invaded Afghanistan, so the United States' primary interest was to roll back the Soviet Empire from the gate of South Asia. And because uh, some of these groups were supported uh, by Pakistan, funded by the uh, Gulf states, especially Saudi Arabia and the United States, and few others were funded and supported by Iran. Saudi Arabia being a Sunni kingdom and Iran being <laughs> representing itself as the leader of the Shia world, they had their own rivalries. And India and Pakistan, they had their own rivalries. So here is the, for the first time we see a series of 
uh, proxy wars in Afghanistan. And these proxy wars is not only that the, at the level of international powers between the Soviet Union and the United States and between regional powers, but also it's going down to be translated at the very tribal level. Like you can see that the India is supporting the Kandahari Pashtuns, for example. And you see that Pakistan is supporting the Giljoi Pashtuns. Since that era, <coughs> almost every single Giljoi Pashtun is supported by Pakistan. So it's no wonder that Haqqani and all these Giljais are supported by Pakistan. Because the Duranis or the Kandaris who were traditionally in power, they were uh, supported by India. And then similarly, you have a situation that you have the ethnic uh, groups against each other, you have the religious groups against each other, and you have uh, Pashtuns against non-Pashtuns. So you have, as in a, Afghanistan is in a kind of a messy situation in a quagmire of all these conflicts that is really very difficult to find a way out of it. وإن وضعيت خب در طول دورانی که فعلا که ما شما قرار داریم واقعا خیلی وحشتناک شده که نه تنها تمام این میراث ها فعلا پا بر جا باقی مانده بلکه انصر های خیلی وحشتناک دیگه هم به این اضافه شده مثل داعش خراسان مثلا گروه های تندروی دیگه از القایده از القایده گرفته تا جمعیت اسلاو تو اخوانو تا سلفی ها و تا تحریر و همه از اینها این واقعا افغانستان فعلا به یک مثل پشترم جناب مونی صاحب در صحبت هایشان یاد کردن که 25 حداقل 25 گروه تروریستی از همه دنیا در افغانستان اینجا جا گرفته خب در طول 20 سال گذشته ما شاهد مداخله نظامی آمریکا بودیم مداخله نظامی آمریکا خواسته یا ناخواسته هم پیامد های قابل انتظار یا پیامت های به حساب که امریکای خودشان میخواستن هم او پیامت ها را داشت و هم پیامت هایی که نمیخواستند اونا را هم داشت خب طالبان که باید سقوط میکرد بعد از 11 سپتامبر خب داستان جنرانش را خبر داریم صحبت ها را زیاد طولانی نمیسازیم در اون بخش القایده باید شکست میخورد طالبان باید حمایتش از القایده دور میکرد و خب در این جنگی که امریکایی ها فکر میکرد که با اسلحه خیلی مدرنی که دارن افغانستان کارش شاید در مدت یک سال و دو سال یک طرفه بسازن و پیروزی مطلق در اینجا اعلان بکنه اما امریکا آن چیزی که نمیدانست این بود که در یک جنگ گیر میفته که اصلا او جنگ در تمامی نداره این چیز بود که امریکا واقعا احساس نمیکرد و با حساب هم نمیکرد خب امریکا ها مبارزه بر ضد تروریسم بیشتر روش تاکید کردن و این باعث سازی شد که ملت سازی و دولت سازی صورت نگیره اما در بعد ملت سازی و دولت سازی خب ما شما هم میبینیم که مداخلات یا به حساب او رقابت های درونی قومی قبیلوی که در داخل خود افغانستان وجود داشت هیچگاه این رهبران نتونستن از آن حلقه های کوچک قبیلوی و قومی خود بیرون برای که واقعا بر ملت در افغانستان کمک بکنه خب over the past 20 years we have seen I mean we all the whole world was, uh, uh, witnessed what the uh, some early analysts uh, or political commentators would uh, comment uh, that this is our show. So basically the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan was seen as the U.S.-led show. So it was really like a show of what? A show of uh, weapons, a show, a show of modern technology, weapon technology, precision technology. So in the, the United States and its allies were really thinking that Afghanistan would be an easy target, so we go and uh, eliminate Al-Qaeda and Taliban and um, the job will be done very quickly. However, the unintended consequence of the U.S. invasion was that America got entangled in a war which did not have seemingly its own end. So it was a war without end. Now what happened as a result, as a result of all this process, what happened, Afghanistan, the conflict in Afghanistan has entered a phase of self-perpetuation. So the conflict in Afghanistan has entered a phase of self-perpetuation. Now you don't need uh, Pakistan, now you don't need Iran, you don't need China, you don't need America, you don't need anyone. The conflict in Afghanistan, violence in Afghanistan feeds itself. 
it feeds itself. It generates. It generates a violence from within. You don't need any more any enemy to come and do something. Why? Because for me, the Taliban are not the only threat for the country, and it's not the most dangerous one either. So these Taliban in power can, in one way or another way, will be removed from power, from power either through a social process or through any other form. We know none of these political powers in Afghanistan have ever stayed longer than 20 years over the past 40, 45 years. So there is no guarantee that Taliban will stay either. However, what is going to remain in Afghanistan are tens and thousands of madrasa graduates who are educated. And I, in many of my publications, have referred to these madrasas as pipelines of violence. These madrasas are pipelines of violence in one form or another form. At its most extreme level, it can enter a phase that is already there of global jihad, which started global jihad started in Afghanistan in the 1980s. At the worst level, it can produce global jihadists. At the worst level, at the least, it will produce graduates who are in a parallel violent society in Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, we don't have a single society. We have parallel societies. And there are not one, there are not two, there are not three, there are not four. There are many. Each ethnicity has become a society in itself. Afghanistan is a mosaic, is a mosaic country in terms of its ethnicity, culture, language, religions. These are sources of strength and beauty, however, Political manipulations have made them, turned them into <laughs> sources of weakness, sources of violence. Now add to that religious hatred, add to that the type of education these madrasa graduates are getting. Now every commander of Taliban, every minister, anyone in power is proud of establishing what they themselves officially call Jihadi madrasas. This is not something hidden secret. This is what the Taliban themselves say. Jihadi madrasas. So this is what's going to remain for a very, very long time, for decades to come in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, we have a lot of support in Afghanistan. The war in Afghanistan is already a part of the war. یعنی که شما نه زارت با امریکا دارید نه به ایران دارید نه به پاکستان دارید به هیچ کس دیگه ندارید که بیا جنگ در افغانستان تغذیه کنه یا ادامه بده بلکه این جنگ یا این خشونت در افغانستان از درون خود خود تغذیه میکنه شما میتونید طالبان از قدرت برکنار کنید هیچ قدرتی در افغانستان در طول 40 سال 45 سال اخیر بیشتر از 20 سال دوام نکرده طالبان هم هیچ تضمینی نداره که اینا دوام میکنن اما اون خشونت را که از طریق این مدرسه ها در افغانستان به وجود خواهد آمد در طول دهه ها و صده های آینده به عنوان منابع خشونت که افغانستان به قدر کافی ضعیف و در گیر جنگ های درونی خواهد ساخت که اصلا غیر قابل تصوره خب البته با تأسف که رهبری دولت در رهبرهای دولتی رهبرهای سیاسی در افغانستان هیچگاه نتونستند که از امو هویت‌های کوچک دایره‌های کوچک هویت‌های قبیلوی دایره‌های کوچک هویت‌های خانوادگی خود برایند هیچگاه نتونستند در یک افغانستان فکر کنند در یک جامعه فکر کنند که در اونجا به مفهوم واقعی کلمه کسرتگرایی یا پلورالیزم تطبیق شود این هیچ گاهی نخواستن و نتونستن هم این یکی از بزرگترین ناکامی های جیوپولیتیکی داخل افغانستان است اگر ما در بحث جیوپولیتیک در محس منطقه گپ میزنیم ما باید یک بار نگاه کنیم در این جیوپولیتیک قومی افغانستان در جیوپولیتیک جغرافی های درونی افغانستان نگاه کنیم شما میبینید که آن کسانی که به عنوان رهبران جامعه افغانستان بودن چی سیاسی چی فرهنگی، چی اجتماعی، از هر نوعی از چی مذهبی واقعا نتوانستند در افغانستان این منطقه را یا خود مملکه به یک جای تبدیل کنند که ما بتانم مثلا با یک پشتون در قندهار، در هلمند، در لشکرگاه بدون ترس برم سفر کنم و در اونچه زندگی کنم یعنی فرصت برای من این امکان نداره 
So what happens in Afghanistan that the political leaders, religious leaders, tribal leaders, regardless what name and adjectives, attributes you give them, what they failed in was that they never managed to come out of the small, narrow identities defined by their families, by their clans, by their tribes. They never managed to come out of that. They never managed to transcend their view and vision. And if you look at the geopolitics of Afghanistan, we also have to look at the geopolitics of the geography of Afghanistan, at the geopolitics of ethnicities of Afghanistan, at the geopolitics of religious composition of Afghanistan. So the country, the leaders, failed always, failed to bring at least a minimum acceptable level of pluralism, which would allow me, a Hazara, an Ismaili, a Shi'i, to have a meaningful conversation with someone else who would be Pashtun, who would be Tajik, who would be Sunni, who would be from other ethnicity or from the other religious interpretation with Hindu, Sikhs, with Jews, with others. So this is a big failure in Afghanistan. And this is often what we overlook. We do talk about the geopolitics. We talk about uh, Iran, Pakistan, Russia, China. But we fail to look at the country itself, at the geo internal geopolitics. We fail to see how our own failures, how our own egos, how this power itself, this will to power, becomes a, a, a big, a major source of catastrophe for the country itself. So power has never been seen as a means to serve the nation. Power has never been seen as a means to, to work for the areas that have been most deprived. We talk about many things. We talk about uh, girls' education. I do accept that, of course, we all accept that should be girls' education. But please, believe me, there is no boys' education either. There is no boys' education. Out of 250,000 teachers, there were 75, 80,000 of those were women. So they are no longer able to go to schools. Who is going to teach boys? Those male teachers are no longer teaching in their schools either. So there is no education in Afghanistan, neither for boys nor for girls. Let us talk about health. There was a very good discussion today about <coughs> peace and health as well. Believe me, when we talk about health, we look at the, at the health at a very simplistic level. Think about women outside urban areas. Think about women outside Kabul, outside major provincial capitals. What level of access do they have to basic health facilities? It's none, absolutely none. Think about shelter. What shelter do people have in Afghanistan? Nothing. You have seen Herat, you have seen any earthquake at whatever magnitude 3.5 Richter scale is going to flatten whole houses in the country. A bit of rain is going to bring flood and people are homeless. Look at the level of displacement, forced displacement by the Taliban, forced displacement by the natural catastrophe. So what we talk about Afghanistan, often we talk about war, we talk about big concepts, about Taliban, everybody else, but we never talk about how to improve the quality of life. So we never think about that. We never talk about that. So all our talks are often preoccupied with how to share this power in Afghanistan. And that doesn't work. Well, we are now in a situation in Afghanistan that uh, unfortunately we are vis-a-vis uh, -vis to an uncertainty. Vis-a-vis -vis to uncertainty. Yes, there is a global uncertainty. There are uncertainty at each level. But when you look at Afghanistan, that's a very different level of uncertainty. Well, one uncertainty is that, of course, there is no legitimate government. There is no legitimate state. Afghanistan is not part of global economy. It's not part of global diplomacy. And Afghanistan is not part of the modern civilizations. But if you look deep down into the situation in Afghanistan, how many girls are kidnapped by the Taliban? I had uh, received a report that talks about over 80,000 kidnapped girls, women being attacked, over 80,000. And this is not the, even the close to the true figure. And this continues. People talk about hope and say that hope is the current valid currency. 
But do we think about how many candles of hope die every day? The light of hope does not burn forever. But we, we fail to think about that. So these are some of the major concerns that I had in my view, and I, I had to say that the geopolitics uh, has its own agenda in Afghanistan. Regional powers, international powers have their own geopolitical political and economic interests, and they prioritize that often over long-term stability. And we people of Afghanistan fail to prioritize what is our priority. So unless we do not know who we are, what situation we are in, how would we know what is our priority, what is our geopolitical, what is our internal geopolitical interest? Now, to conclude, and then I'll say a bit in Persian as well, my conclusion. On the one hand, uh, international powers, regional countries, have meddled and messed up the situation in Afghanistan. On the other hand, on the positive side, well, not the positive side, but at least on the side that we can hope is that they have created their bases in Afghanistan. Iran has its own bases in Afghanistan, within Taliban, within non-Taliban groups. Pakistan has its own bases in Afghanistan. U.S. has its own and other countries as well. If this geopolitical interest can compromise with each other, these regional countries and international powers can compromise with each other, then they can influence those bases in Afghanistan, which I would sometimes call it power holders. And that's a hope that peace and stability can be brought back to Afghanistan. Hope to to say Jumle Akhir Khatim Mekonim Ke Kishwar Hai Mantakawi Kishwar Kudrat Hai Bain Mali Dar Afghanistan Mudakhlati Firawani Ra Anjom Dadan Dau Ki Jai Shak Nis Ala Yag Umidi Wujud Dara Ki Inha Hama Ishan Niro Hai Ra Ya Jaiga Hai Ra Dar Dakhil Jami Afghanistan Dara Dar Dakhil Afghanistan Dara Pakistan نفوذ خود در بین طالبان غیر طالبان داره ایران نفوذ خود در بین طالبان و غیر طالبان داره چین روسیه آمریکا همه اینها حالا یک امیدی که وجود داره این است که اگر این یک تفاهم یک توافق در بین این کشورهای منطقه و قدرت‌های بین‌المللی صورت بگیره خب در اون صورت این امید وجود داره که اینها میتونه اون نفوذی هایی که در داخل افغانستان داره اونا را یا به فشار یا به هر شکلی که خودشان میدانه این قناعت حاصل کنه که در افغانستان یک صلح پایداری به وجود بیاید در غیر از او اگر که این تفاوت‌های ژئوپلیتیکی منطقه و بین‌المللی با هم نزدیک نشه آمدن صلح در افغانستان به یک معمای خواهد باقی ماند و این شبکه‌های جنگ گسترش خواهد یافت و کمتر نخواهد شد تشکر بسیار